Lads, it's been a while. I've been quiet. And I've got something to tell you. I broke my collarbone like an absolute numpty and I've only got my left hand at the moment. So making videos has been a bit of a challenge. But I've got a whole load of metal in me now though. So I'm like a technology human hybrid. Much like the latest generation of hybrid weather and climate models that blend traditional physics-based approaches with AI. And the segue of the year award goes to... And yes, I have been thinking about that intro for quite a while. This video is about weather and climate research and how technology is changing the way that we predict the weather and project what future climates might look like. Everyone is getting gassed about AI at the moment, from tech majors to uni students. And while it has some benefits, it obviously also has some issues. Weather and climate scientists have been using certain types of AI for a while though, including the UK Met Office. And before anyone starts typing any rage comments, it's important to distinguish between different types of artificial intelligence. When you say AI, most people immediately think of the kind of rubbish chatbots that let their bank get away without paying anyone to actually answer the phone, large language models like ChatGPT that cost the planet and make us all dumber, or image generators that steal artists' work and don't give them any credit. But we're not talking about integrating Grok into the weather forecast here. We're actually talking much more about using clever ways to process, analyze, and enhance existing measurements and tools. Here's Professor Kirsten Dale, Chief AI Officer at the UK Met Office, explaining how they use AI tech for weather and climate science. But we've already been using AI for quite some time. They're perhaps not calling it AI. For example, we use Gaussian processes for downscaling. We use clustering for uh, cloud classification. So this was something that was already underway at the Met Office, but the AI revolution that we've seen in the last few years has really accelerated progress. And we're really excited to see where it might go. The techniques Kirsten mentioned there are examples of what we could broadly call AI. Essentially, these are statistical methods that can be run on large amounts of environmental data to find patterns, search for errors and inconsistencies, and streamline processing. Weather forecasting relies on huge volumes of data, and bringing that data in, making sense of it, and turning it into something that's actually usable for the public requires a lot of computer power. Using statistical techniques like clustering, emulation, or machine learning, and more on those in just a sec, can help speed this process up. The Met Office is a big data organisation. Big data is our everyday. So every day we have 215 billion observations coming through the organisation. We run 3 million lines of code in the weather model and we produce 18 terabytes of data a day. That's 27,000 CDs. This is a phenomenal amount of data. Traditional weather models use maths to turn things that happen in the real world, like clouds, sun, rain and wind, into a computer-friendly format. Those mathematical descriptions of the real world are written into millions of lines of computer code in the same way that code is used to generate entire new universes in video games. That code gets run by enormous computers, computers that are big enough to take up entire warehouses, using our understanding of the laws of physics and weather to look into the future and produce a forecast. Of course, running all of those calculations on huge computers takes up a hell of a lot of energy and resources. These computers are doing millions of calculations every single second. So if we can make the process any more efficient, that saves both time and energy. AI approaches, like the ones mentioned earlier, are a way of allowing technology to learn from historical patterns. And they can be much more efficient than running millions of complex calculations. When you think about AI for weather forecasting, one of the really big benefits is that um, AI models are really fast. Uh, not just a little bit fast, but tens of thousands of times faster than traditional approaches to weather forecasting. One of the really exciting things about AI is the potential to move beyond what would, what would have been possible without AI, so, um, because it has this much lower computational cost. Some weather features are captured easily and simply with single mathematical equations, whereas others are much more complex and include lots of interacting processes that make them much harder 
order to get right. Clouds and rain are a great example of that. It's often difficult to predict exactly when and where it will rain because clouds move, they change a lot, they also depend on lots of different interactions that happen at the really, really small scale. Hybrid techniques blend AI with traditional approaches. They maximize the value of traditional physics-based computer models whilst also ensuring efficiency and speed by applying AI. Because compute time is a finite resource, efficiency improvements mean the power of physical models can be applied in other areas, improving predictions overall. This is a pretty new field, but lots of studies in the last few years have shown that hybrid physics AI approaches outperform either physics only or AI only models. That's been demonstrated for a really wide variety of applications, including forecasting extreme precipitation, flood warnings, and even the generalized weather forecast. But we still need physical models because without the grounding in that real world understanding, AI techniques basically just make no sense. We see a future where physics-based traditional forecasting runs alongside AI or data-driven methods. And the reason we see that is for three basic reasons. First of all, we need to build trust in the model, in the forecast. Um, and to do that, you need to understand what's going on within the forecast. You need the critical process understanding, and that comes through numerical weather prediction, the physics-based approach to forecasting. Secondly, um, when you run an AI model, there's, there's two stages. There's the training, um, and then there's the inference. And the inference is like um, the weather prediction or the weather um, forecast. And that is based on the experience of the model in the trainings data. And then the third is, um, back to training again, AI models need data to train on. And that training data comes from numerical weather prediction. It comes from our traditional weather forecasting models. Hybrid AI physics models use machine learning techniques, which means that the AI needs something to learn from. For weather and climate prediction, you typically take some data from the recent past, like observations of, say, temperature and rainfall, for instance, and then allow the AI to learn from it. This process, called training, essentially involves describing the relationships between variables, which in this case maybe is temperature and rainfall, using statistics. If you provide enough training examples, then these relationships can then be applied to new data to provide predictions without having to do the calculations directly using more involved physical methods. And that, of course, saves time and computer power. The only problem is AI is only as good as its training data. And in some locations and for some problems where we have loads of good training data, AI models work really, really well. So they're good for predicting the weather of well-observed places like Europe or the UK, but for a changing climate, or say Antarctica, it's a different picture. The problem with predicting climate change with AI is that the goalposts are constantly moving. An important characteristic of climate heating is extreme events, which are by very definition rare but impactful. But because they don't appear often in the training data and because the frequency of extremes also changes as the climate heats up, it's very difficult for AI to predict them. And that is exactly why physical models that use the fundamental laws of physics and our understanding of climate change are still so essential. However, what you can do is use AI to improve existing physics-based climate models in different ways. Let's go back to Kirsten Dale at the Met Office for some examples. One of the really exciting things about um, um, AI is that you can use it to downscale a model to a, the resolution that you need to really make a decision. So, for example, last year we did a, a piece of work looking at how you use AI to get from a 1.5 kilometre model down to 100 metres. Well, that is mind blowing because that's like 100 metres is your street, you know? So that means you might understand the impacts of weather or climate change at a street level, which is phenomenal. And if you use an AI model, you can do that at a tiny, tiny, tiny wee fraction of the compute. What the UK Met Office are doing is harnessing the strengths of both physics-based and AI-based methods to produce more useful information for the end user, which could be businesses, towns, or little old you and me. 
By blending the two techniques, you get the accuracy that comes from the physical model and the detail and efficiency that comes from AI tech. That means we can make more impactful predictions, for instance, at the local scale of cities or regions, which is what is needed to adapt and prepare for the future to protect communities and make decisions about what to do to protect ourselves in a changing climate. There are also some other really exciting applications of AI in the weather and climate research space, like forecasting Arctic sea ice conditions at the seasonal timescale, something which has historically always been really, really difficult using traditional approaches. ISNAP, a system developed by the British Antarctic Survey and the Alan Turing Institute, outperforms other methods of sea ice prediction using just a tiny fraction of the computer power. Whatever happens, we're going to need to live with AI, and if if we use it carefully and in a considered way, it can really help in the fight against climate change. Using a precautionary principle is crucial though, and making sure that technological changes are backed up by robust and peer-reviewed science is critical. Climate action needs to happen now, both to cut emissions and to adapt to the inevitable. And the careful and intentional use of technology can help speed that process up. But tech is never a silver bullet. We already know what we need to do. We just need to get on with it. If you value the work that I do and want to support the channel, then luckily for you, you can. You can join over here on YouTube, but you can also sign up as a supporter on Patreon. And the link for that is over here. Thanks as ever to my wonderful patrons who are just really bloody lovely. Watch this one next and I'll catch you in the next one. All right, bye.